Hello, I'm Rebecca Lowington. We just announced our new Cerebrus wafer scale cluster with some unheard of performance numbers. Near perfect linear scaling across millions of cores for training large natural language processing AI models. I wanted to dive a bit deeper into weight streaming, the technology that makes our clusters work. And who better to help me do that? Two of the minds behind weight streaming. I'd like to introduce you to Michael James, co-founder and chief architect of advanced technologies at Cerebrus, and research scientist Joel Hessness of Cerebrus. So, gentlemen, thanks much for joining me. Hey, thanks for having us, Rebecca. So, first, just to get started, Michael, could you tell us a bit about your background and what you do at Cerebrus, and indeed how you came to start the company? I, certainly. So, I, I think be, before I got into computer hardware design, I, I, I have a background in neurobiology and mathematics. I, I, I have always been very interested in how moving geometric patterns uh, can carry out computations. And th that's one of the ideas I, I brought into Cerebrus, where we've designed uh, the world's largest computer processor, uh, 850,000 cores. And essentially computations move across this device as wave fronts with all of the cores doing uh, little micro ops. And it, it has been really fun to, to see this develop into the, the machine you described today, where uh, it lo looks like you're in our, our data center with uh, just aisles of equipment right now. That's well, when I took the photograph. <laughs> um, Joel, same question for you. Yeah, so uh, my background is actually computer architecture, uh, generally around heterogeneous systems uh, that you, they use different types of processors. Uh, so I did my grad school work in heterogeneous processors and then uh, sort of evolved that work towards algorithms that could benefit from uh, from heterogeneous systems. And so uh, machine learning uh, was coming up and, and turned out to be one of those sets of applications. So uh, I went to work at Baidu Research previously, and uh, we studied some scaling characteristics of these applications. So you can get better accuracy by training larger models and training on more data. And it's sort of predictable gains. Uh, well, so my read on that was that the community was just going to start doing this like let's scale up and scale out and cerebrus was starting to build hardware that that sort of fit that and that's when i jumped over to join cerebrus and, and help out with the scaling uh, so it's been exciting so far uh, at cerebrus i'm i'm working on uh, large-scale language applications uh, getting those to train efficiently in our hardware and sort of enable some of the the downstream research that we expect with our hardware so things like uh, training sparse models for instance that's going to be a subject for another one of these so let's hold that um michael just to get us started again um how has ai been evolving in recent years so it, when, when I think of the um, story of re recent AI, uh, it, it starts with the, the idea that sort of statistics connect to, to natural phenomena. And we, we've seen trained models doing things that, uh, that had for, at least in the, the AI dark period, uh, been believed to be outside the reach of computers. And that, that caused a, a whole bunch of activity in the field. And so we, we came and designed a computer processor much larger than even these large problems that were being run to, to accelerate what's happening. And since then, AI has only uh, continued on the, this exponential trajectory. The, the models are getting larger, and now, now we have these foundation models. Uh, what, what's driving this growth is we see that the language processing not only works, but that as the models get bigger, the accuracy improves, and some uh, emergent phenomena come into the mix. So, so you're your bigger model isn't just doing a little bit better on the score, but is picking up new um, qualitative behaviors. And no one right now knows where that stops. So that there's a huge drive to see how, how big can we make these things. And we're talking trillions, tens of trillions of parameters on the on the horizon going forward. It's almost impossible to imagine a model with, the tri with trillions of parameters. Um, so Joel, exponential growth in models, what's the compute challenge to train these enormous things? Yeah, so that was that's a, a big part of our motivation is trying to service that need. Well, um, these these larger models are already using um, more than uh, tens of thousands of exaflops, which uh, you know just ten or fifteen years ago we didn't imagine that we we need this much compute. 
And if you look at where we want to be for accuracy of these models, we think we'd want you know to spend 10 years training a model uh, in terms of compute time uh, in on existing hardware. So uh, in order to service that, we need to have uh, better systems, better algorithms, try to extract more parallelism uh, to use more systems concurrently. Uh, we need to do that. Uh, and we need to have um, just more total compute capability. So I'll, I'll note that well, no one wants to wait 10 years to train their model. We, we do currently wait about 20 years to train our, our children. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to do it a bit quicker than that, I think, Mike. <laughs> well, I mean, um, if, if you talk about <laughs> I, I, for, from birth to, to get in your degree, uh, usually is a little bit more than 20. So, Michael, today only a few companies with massive resources are able to train these really big models, and even then it takes a very long time. How is Cerebus trying to change that? So we, we've started by making the, this processor the, this um, almost 100 times bigger than the next largest device possible. And, and with that comes all kinds of computational resources. We just have uh, massively more bandwidth. So our, our memory bandwidth, 20 petabytes per second from the main memory to the, the uh, compute and plane. And th that's, that's a lot. But um, as we talked about, the, these models are on an exponential growth pattern. And so the, there's no um, fi fixed resource increase that, that's going to do that. So in, instead of taking um, one model and spreading it across this entire big machine, we're, we're looking at, at flipping our, our training paradigm around where you have the, these enormous terabytes, multi-terabyte models outside the machine, and we broadcast them in. And now you, using the um, unique computabilities of the machine to perform types of operations that won't be possible on other equipment. And, and we're looking at, at that to give extra acceleration to the training process. So what, one thing that is really nice about this is uh, with, with the model outside the machine, you can gain together as many compute wafers as you want to collaborate on the training process. So Joel, how, does the, how do we make this clustering work with our systems um, that's both easy to use and also doesn't have the, the scaling overhead that flips conventional systems. Sure, yeah. As Michael described, we're able to train extremely large models on a single system, and that's by moving the model itself off to another set of systems and then and streaming the weights onto our wafer. For, for extremely large models, like uh, you know trillions of parameters or more, uh, that would be computationally intensive. It would take forever to train on a single system. And so we need to scale out to multiple systems. Uh, we can use data parallel training to do that. Uh, and we can do it in a, in a simplified form, given that we can train such a large model on a single system. It's almost like a couple clicks and we can train on a much larger set of systems, spreading the data across those systems uh, and getting uh, near linear improvements in throughput to train. Uh, Joel, the, the, there's one thing you said that reminds me of a, of a baked-in advantage that the Cerebrus equipment has, which is because you, you can train these huge models on a single system, you, you can do a lot of uh, your, your debug, your early model bring-up testing to see if there, there are NANs or other weird behavior in the model at the scale of a single system. You, you don't need that full cluster to um, conceptualize and, and get started, and it's sort of only only when you're ready for the large scale, you bring in that double click that you mentioned to recruit the other nodes. Right, and I gather that's pretty unusual because today you, someone had someone can kind of design a system and then when they want to throw it over to a large cluster, it's a completely new programming effort. Is that true, Joe? Generally, yes. So uh, training on a set of smaller devices generally requires splitting up the, the parallelism, the computation across those devices. And if you try to do that with a data parallel approach, the, the, just the number of devices becomes a challenge because you have to communicate between all of them. And so uh, other, other vendors, other hardware, you'll need to use other forms of parallelism like model parallelism. Uh, and so then you have this difficulty of different types of parallelism that you're employing to, to train at that scale. So uh, with, with the Cerebrus hardware, the 
forms of parallelism that might be complicated, like model parallelism, we don't really need to do that. That We get that in a single box. Uh, and so you can do debugging uh, at scale there and then click to scale out to, uh, to data parallel to many machines. Click to scale out, that's a beautiful phrase. I know if I was an ML practitioner, I know which I would want. I'd like to do it all myself. Um, so this is brilliant, but whose idea was it? Who had the idea? Somebody? So I, I give the lion's share of the credit to Michael for, the, for how, we're gonna, how we do it. Um, and maybe he can tell the story of that. Um, my, my contribution is maybe more around uh, understanding why it's feasible, why it could work in the weight streaming mode. So if I, I think back to we've been doing this for for a while now, it takes a, a bit to get a, a product from uh, from concept out, out the the door. Um, but the the, um, the there's been a focus in the company for a while, thinking uh, how are we going to use our biggest chip to attack the, these absolutely enormous models? And so um, the, there's been a, a lot of thinking about what what might change in the paradigm and. Um, the, the group I was working with it had just come off of doing uh, some work with the National Lab solving some fluid dynamics problems. Uh, we, we saw exceptionally high performance. So one, one machine was performing hundreds of times faster than the customer's supercomputer entire uh, uh, warehouse scale facility. And uh, it, it was also doing faster than real-time physics uh, at, at multi-million um, multi cell models, which is a, a pretty big deal. So we, we, we saw some of this, this great performance and we thought, are, are there elements of, of the way that that is executing that can also apply to these terrifically large language models? And when, when we looked at it, we, we changed something um, deep inside the, the way every layer is works. Um, instead of being a, a matrix multiply, we broke it out into BLAS1 operations. These are um, uh, vector vector operations and they, they are, um, absolutely generic. They, they, they are your um, gen generic linear algebra elements that, that let you build up any of the matrix ops or, or vector ops or, or other things you want. You can get by doing these more fine grain operations. And when, when we put all of that on the wafer uh, and, and you sort of work the, the problem backwards, if this is your, your strategy for how you're going to perform a layer, where, where, where are the activations living, where do the waste stream on? Um, we, we brought this all the way out to the edge of the chip and then we saw it's a huge model. We're just going to put the weights outside and bring them on. And what what was um, re really great about this is the um, the the uh, vector vector ops let you run a matrix without any block requirements. You can get arbitrary sparsity patterns. You, you can accelerate to any level of sparsity. Now, normally when you're taking use of sparsity, you need huge amounts of bandwidth, and we have all of that bandwidth on the processor for accelerating these operations. We were concerned, well, how are you gonna have the weights off the chip? Um, does that mean we're, we're gonna need a petabytes per second uh, fat pipe to get onto the processor itself? And it turns out if you make the weights themselves a sparse element instead of the activations, um, now, now the, the amount of bandwidth to stream the weights is proportional to the acceleration that you get. And so you, you can use the fixed on-ramp to get an unlimited acceleration on the machine. And when I say uh, unlimited, maybe is capped by um, ballpark about a thousand X of, of what the, the native sparsity can provide on the machine. That's really cool. The fact that you were able to think about something you did in an, H, an HPC application that is to most of us utterly different to AI and take the properties of our processor, incredible memory and uh, bandwidth and bandwidth between compute elements and to do the same thing for AI. I think it's really cool. So, what, what, on. One thing we, we really like about this is not not only are you getting all of the machine's capabilities, but you, you get a great flexibility in how it's used. So you can choose to run a model fully dense, fully um, fully sparse. You can alternate back and forth. Um, we're sort of giving the, the flexibility of these vector ops in, into the full model definition that you have of the AI and the model designer side. And that, that's something maybe, Joel, you, you might want to talk about. Sure. Yeah. So I came at this, uh, the weight streaming mode from a, a bit different angle uh, that I, my prior experience had been 
scaling out applications on GPUs. And I was actually helping a friend try to train a very large GPT model uh, for some of his, uh, his, his interests. And trying to get a, a large model to fit on a GPU was quite painful. And one of the strategies that we used was to move the weights off of the GPU's memory out to the host memory. And uh, when, when we ran that, the, the performance was not terrible. It wasn't great, but it, it did give me some ideas that maybe we should consider this uh, for Cerebrus. And so we, we kind of did the back of the envelope uh, calculations like that. And, and so this, is, I think, was where Michael's uh, experience and and testing aligned with mine, we, we both came to very similar conclusions about the amount of bandwidth that we would need to move uh, weights on and off the wafer. Um, so it, uh, it looked re really positive. It was something that we figured we should try. And then uh, I think Michael's team uh, took this to prototype and make sure that it, it actually functions. Okay. So you started on this. Um, how did these the two threads come together, the two bits of work that you're both working on? Well, it's a startup environment here. So you, you've got to imagine that uh, um, there, there are um, uh, many, many interested people and engineers and activities in the company. And, and we try to have lots of discussion and, and sharing. And, and we use that to help cultivate the uh, the creative environments. So, so Joel, I, I think you you and I were um, talking about the the path going forward, or, or something probably ge generic like that. Uh, which parts do you remember? Yeah, I, I actually remember Michael uh, starting to put slides together and and kind of characterize some of these uh, more analytical uh, proofs proofs of concept that we had. Um, and then there, his team was prototyping some of the kernels, and then we started taking it to leadership. and And the the question kind of fanned out from there. Like we we gathered a input from a lot of different groups about how we would do this, and uh, so it it changed uh, our concept of stack design that we had to consider how we would change. Our, uh, our programming stack, the, the way that a user might use the system, and uh, actually turned it into something that was a little bit more elegant maybe than what we'd pri previously uh, tried to build. That the kernels, like Michael's describing, the kernels are sort of simple, uh, simple operations that can run in isolation by themselves. They occupy the whole wafer. And then when it's done, you switch out to the next kernel. And that's uh, it's simpler than, than other techniques that we'd considered in the past. So um, the, the whole company started getting involved in this, this design process after some, uh, some discussions with leadership, how we should do this. Uh, that, that became a very exciting time because uh, it, I think a lot of people started to feel a lot of ownership in the, in the process and to get involved. Um, and then, so Michael's team continued building on a, a proof of concept stack where we got to do a lot of very interesting experimentation, um, more proofs of concept around the, the IO, the performance of kernels while the, the production stack was coming, uh, coming up also. Uh, and, and now today we've, we've been developing the, the production stack to the point where we are training full models end to end training them at scale and even uh, across multiple machines. So very exciting. That's pretty cool. Michael, it must have been very exciting when you, when you first saw your equations and spreadsheets actually start to work and do something. Can you tell me a bit about that experience? Well, well there's always a, a great joy in any hardware or big software project. So we, we call that the bring up phase. And when you're doing uh, bring up that there there will be engineers uh, work, working usually throughout the the day and night. Uh, people don't want to get off the the problem they're working on. Uh, I I can say the the process here is, is uh, um, basically what you heard. It it goes from a, a idea to to people thinking maybe this is possible. You you work things out on a on a spreadsheet. You, you try to um, balance everything. You you um, show with that that there's no 
uh, mathematical reason to, to preclude it from working, uh, then, then it becomes a, a lot of engineering work. You, you'll want to see um, a, a layer, a few operations working, and, and you got to write the, uh, the, the microcode for the machine and, and look and make it efficient. We, we start out on, on simulators, you know, so world's biggest processor, you got millions of arithmetic units, but, but you start out on, on three or four. We're going to simulate the, the execution. You, you watch what, what's happening. And when, when that's correct, you scale it a little bit larger, you, you find bugs along the, the way. Um, and, and eventually you have something working at scale. Maybe you're doing an overnight run in a simulator. Uh, look, looks good. You, you move it onto the hardware platform. Uh, things keep working. You, you, you hope you're, you're not going to find a silicon bug that sends you back to the fab. Um, occasionally you do find a thing or two, but uh, the, the team's quite good at looking for, for workarounds. And, and we have a um, you know, sort of second generation products, so things are pretty stable at, at this point. And uh, you know, by, by the time we saw in our lab uh, a single layer with a trillion parameters, that's a million by million map mull. Um, run into the machine, plus the ability to accelerate that with sparsity. We, we were quite confident we had something good here. Uh, and that, that sort of uh, do dovetailed into the, um, the the view that Joel was sharing, where, uh, where we tried to get buy-in from the, the entire company. Let, let's make this a product. Let, let's meet this world's uh, largest language language model space. And here we are with the Cerebrus Wavescale cluster. Joel, how can users give this a try? Yeah, so Cerebrus has released uh, our software stack, CSoft, and we uh, you can download today. You can even use the use our uh, simulators if you'd like to test at the small scale, like Michael was describing. But uh, all the development through that stack will work on our hardware today, so uh, it's it's very easy to pick up and use. Um, trying to to build out, uh, like I was saying previously, we can run the very large models, we can run them on a single system of ours and uh, sort of verify that things are operating correctly, things like numerics and uh, that it appears to be converging. And then uh, it, it really is just a few clicks to get it to scale out to, to more devices. So um, it is a, a very simple software stack at this point compared to, to other uh, systems that people might be using. Ridiculously fast and easy to use. What's not to like? And we have many ways to many ways to get started. So please do visit our website, reach out to us. And there are lots of ways to get started. So both, what have you learned from this project that you're going to use again? Michael, do you want to start this one off? Uh, certainly. Well, I, I always enjoy in the engineering process when you can connect uh, domains that are different and um, here we connected something intrinsic in the way the, the processor can perform operations to even more flexibility to the, the ML user to, to allow in completely arbitrary unstructured sparsity patterns. And, and moreover, I, I like when, uh, when you were uh, talking, we brought an idea that came from HPC uh, straight, straight into how the AI execution is working. And I, I think in, um, in engineering and, and, and science generally, you, you never want to um, to ignore the, the other groups, so look all around at a broad set of things that are happening, and uh, often a good connection is available there. Indeed, indeed, and that is amazing that way. So, Joel, anything to add? Yeah, so some of my prior experience had been in entrepreneurship education, helping people get companies started. This was this has been one of the the most interesting personal experiences, uh, trying to get weight streaming off the ground in that. This is a very large project in a pretty large startup organization. And tr just working through all of those pieces, trying to get the, the right people into the, the right parts of the bring up and development and enabling others to be successful, getting to collaborate with people like Michael and, and vet out our ideas. This, this was a really great experience and, and something that uh, I'm hoping we can continue uh, continue at Cerebrus as a as a very useful uh, process, like conceptualizing, vetting, and then and getting buy in and getting people to develop. So it's been it's a, been a great learning experience. Nice. So just to finish off, Joel, what's next for you? 
Yeah, so we're we're still trying to uh, develop out the largest possible scale models on our hardware. Uh, we have some bits and pieces running in our labs, and we have them running across many systems. So we want to make sure that we deliver those pieces. The the biggest uh, features that are of interest now are leveraging some of these unique potential advantages of the hardware, like training sparse models. Uh, so we want to make sure that we capture the the opportunity there. We're we're doing research in our machine learning algorithms group where, where I work to try to figure out what those algorithms should be. We're going to keep doing the research there. Uh, I think we're interested and open to partnerships and collaborations on these uh, these sorts of studies. And then, yeah, make sure that people are able to use the the hardware, and leverage that performance benefit for training sparse. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, once you've shown you have a machine that can do things that nothing, no one else can do, no other kind of machine can do, the more minds you can have thinking about the new things you can do with it, the better. Definitely. And Michael, what's next for you? Well, I, I want to echo, we, we are really interested in pushing the envelope here. And we, we have uh, um, a, a large array that can train a, a really large model, but we, we're not satisfied seeing that done um, just to, to replicate existing results. We, we want to see how that research can uh, can move forward and what, what the structure of tomorrow's models is going to be. Uh, and it, it is that that this most exciting is when your large engineering project meets the the unknown, uh, where, where uh, more creativity is going to have to fold into it to see um, what, what techniques are, are going to be um, th those that drive us to the next level. And uh, if if we're lucky, that will bring us into another design iteration uh, because it it's really risk we love the engineering challenge of um, of what, what new things might be possible if only we build them. Well, that's an excellent note to finish this conversation on. Gentlemen, thank you both very much for joining me today. It's been absolutely fascinating. And um, again, if you, want, if you want to have a go, reach out to us and let's get started. <laughs>